God, ooh, to have a revelation of Jesus. It's through the hard times, the challenging times, the contrary winds, the trials and tribulations that he manifests himself even more. And we learn to just let it all go. We learn to become singular in our pursuit of nothing else matters but Him and the glory. We learn to die to ourselves and take up our cross and follow Him. I pray, I pray that your heart, I pray that your prayer, I pray that your focus, I pray that your journey, that you allow everything else to become dim in the light of Him. Everything else to become dim in the light of Him. In the light of Him. Hallelujah. The song says, I believe God. His word is true. I believe God. What He says He will do, He will always come through. Do you believe that God will always come through? I don't know how, when, through what vessel, but I do know that God will always come through. Because it's His promise to never leave or forsake. He is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our tongue. And God, we believe you this morning. We believe you to do what you always want to do, and that is move on the behalf of your people. Hallelujah. I believe God. His word is true. I believe God. What he said he will do. And I believe God. Will always come through. I will choose to believe. I believe God. Oh, I believe God. His word is true. And I believe.
Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Have more echo. Okay. Praise God because I still hear the echo. There's a lot of echo in there. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. There we go. Hallelujah. Is it the speakers? A little more compression. Could you hear me? Oh, you don't. Okay. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. glory, glory. Jesus, bless your name. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. That's good. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Lord. That's good. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord on my soul and all that is within me. Bless his name. Bless the Lord on my soul and all that is we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Father. Come on, let's have our confession. Get into the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad to be in the house of God? Man, man, I love church. I love church. I, I'm a, I, when I was in California, I lived in the church. I, I just love church. I, I just love church. I, it was a, it was a, truly a refuge, a safe haven uh, for me. God bless you, my brother Aldo and Edwin. Have a wonderful day, man of God. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. I love, I love God's people. I love to be around God's people. Amen. I, I feel a, a comfort around God's people. You know, I, I, I'm, I used, I'm from the street, so, so I, I used to love uh, the street. I used to love the street. My mother said, he said, boy, boy, the street gonna get you one day. She, God, I love being in the street. Even if I was just on the stoop with my boys, just sitting down playing with or, or, or dirty hearts or, 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 or three or four in the morning, just, just talking nonsense, just, just with your boys, you know, just sitting down. And so, so I love that. And God transferred that into the kingdom of God. And when I got to California, he, he put me he put me in the hands of a man named John Bunkley from Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, man. Oh, man. I could never repay him. I could never repay him for his patience, for his, for his love of me, for his love of God, for, for his wisdom. He, he just imparted to me. And then it was Reuben. And Charles McKee and there was Chuck Canizero. They just poured into me. And, I, and they must have seen something that, that God told them to. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what did God see in Cain and Abel. Because they were, they were brothers. But God has a way of, of just knowing who is who. And, and some people... Uh, God will tell you, 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 you got to get away from them. And not because you don't love them. You, you, sometimes you, you just got to get away from certain people. And if left to our own decisions, our own choices, we probably wouldn't do it. I probably would have never left my, my posse, you know. But we started growing up. And, you, you, know, you know, guys, you know, meet their girlfriends and you call him on Friday night, what are we going to do? He said, man, I can't come because she wants me to go someplace with her. And so you find the posse breaking up. You're getting mad now, you, you know, because that's all you know. But that's the way God sometimes used to get you into something new. Yes. I said once before, he'll cause even your best friends to betray you if you stay in one place too long. 
mm -hmm. to get you to understand. And that's what we have an understanding. Sometimes we think we got to go someplace to get an understanding. I said, a person used to tell me, I won't be here next Sunday because I there's a I got to go get a word in Texas. I got to go get a word in Florida. And I had to tell her one day, I said, you don't get a word when you read the word. <laughs> you can save your airfare, your, your, your hotel fee. And this was a powerful woman because she loved the Lord. So I wasn't insulting her, but I but I just couldn't understand that. You know, I got to go someplace to get a word. I, and I go to conferences. I don't go anymore, but I used to go to a lot of conferences. Stuff like that, but I, I don't go anymore. That's not what the Lord told me to do. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Not a doubter. Jesus, you're my Lord. Jesus, you're my Lord. I believe the word of God. I believe the word of God. And I accept what it has to offer. Speak to me and I will obey. I'm Christ centered. And I'm spirit led. I'm blessed. I know that a little prayer results in a little power. I have and I need a lot of power. So I pray. And prayer guarantees me power to stand in Jesus' name. Turn to 2 Timothy, if you will. We're going to spend most of our time in Genesis, laying the foundation of a teaching. We're, going, we're talking about opening our spiritual eyes. And of course, it at some point, we'll go to 2 Kings chapter 6, where the Assyrians that surrounded the prophet Elisha and him and his servant were uh, inside, and the servant comes out, and he sees all of the army of the Assyrians uh, surrounding them. And it, it, it's amazing. This whole nation had come to get one man who spoke to God. Because what happened, to give you a little background before you read this, the king of Assyria thought that he had a spy in his ranks because everywhere he would go, Israel was either waiting for them or they had fled. And so he called his generals in and he said, he said, okay, which one of you is for our enemy? And, and one of his leaders stepped up and said, neither my king, but there's a prophet in Israel and he tells you what you speak about in your bed chain. Oh, that's the gift of prophecy. Isn't that's a seer. That's a word of knowledge. That's understanding. That's an intimacy with God. Now, this is not Elijah. This is Elisha, his, uh, his student. And his student did twice as many miracles as his, his master, Elijah. Remember when Elijah was getting ready to go when, uh, and he, uh, he uh, Elisha came to him and said, give me a double portion of the anointing that's on you. You see, sometimes you got to value your teacher. Yes. You, know, you got to value your teacher. You may not have the best relationship. You may not, uh, you know, be, you know, hang out buddies. But if you are getting the words of life from a man or a woman of God, you have to cover them. You have to pray for them. You have to support their needs. If there's financial needs, if there's is there emotional needs, this is what the church does. You undergird. Remember Aaron and her, they held up yes. Moses' arms. Yes. And every time Moses' arms were held up, what happened? Joshua in the valley defeated the Amalekites. But as soon as uh, Moses' arms got tired and they came down, all of a sudden the Amalekites began to turn and defeat Israel. And so what did uh, Aaron and Hur did? They, because they also were getting tired as well. Both of them pushed up big stones on each side of Moses and sat down and just held his arm up. Because they understood his victory was their victory. Yes. See, we have to have what scripture says, the eyes of our understanding open. Well, we can't just walk around saying, I'm a Christian and there's no uh, understanding because we can have knowledge, right? Knowledge, the Bible said, it puffs up. God wants us to have knowledge. But if you just have knowledge, it, it, it puffs up. He said that it's the spirit that makes alive. Yes. Mm -hmm. So as we're reading the word of God and the spirit of God is mixing it with faith, we have now a greater understanding for your, for your deacons, your deaconesses, uh, for your ushers, for, uh, for Aldo and, and Edwin, for, for Sister Sparkle, for Ralph, for everyone that does any, anything in the church. You can never begin to pray for them because if you don't think they get attacked yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. because they put their hands to the plow. So we had a covenant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when um, the um, the king of 
Syria wanted to know who was the spy. And he said, there's no spy. But there's a prophet in Israel, Elisha, and he tells you what you do or what you speak about in your bedchamber. And so uh, the, the king of Assyria said, go get Elisha. And he, he didn't say go destroy Israel. He didn't say, he didn't say go destroy the, the captains of Israel's army or host of their army, their great army. He said, go get the prophet. I want the one that speaks for God. Because he, uh, this is a prophet. Because every time we try to catch Israel in a place they're going, and every time we think we're safe, Israel plunders us. And so they had sent the whole army of Assyria. And uh, Elijah's servant, he comes, he gets up, and he, he goes outside, and he sees all these Assyrians. And Elijah, uh, his servant, he runs back, and he tells his prophet, he said, what are we going to do? And what did Elijah say? Those that are for us. He hadn't even gone outside yet. He's still in the house. He, he, you, know, you know, probably putting on his socks and, you know, putting on his watch. He, he didn't even see what his servant saw. But he knew what his servant didn't see. Right. And he said, those that are for us are greater than those that are for, the, uh, for our enemy. And, and so uh, the servant was still nervous. What did he pray? God, open his eyes. And as soon as he prayed that prayer, all of a sudden, the servant sees all of the Assyrian army and their chariots surrounded by God's angels on chariots. See, you kind of see that as well. When you begin to look into that realm, and I've never seen an angel, I've never seen this, you know, celestial host, but I know because God says, my angel beholds the face of God every day. I know that there's an angelic ministry that's still in operation, even though we have the Holy Spirit, that I can speak a word. Now, if you don't speak a word, and if you allow the devil to penetrate your mind and your mouth, you're in big trouble. Because it'll set you down from speaking the words that are necessary. Heaven's waiting for you to give a command. That's right. That's right. Okay, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. Hey, hey, say, you can sit down. Y'all been standing up for eight hours. <laughs> and when the pastor gets God, praise God. And after we read this in 2 Timothy, we're going to go to uh, Genesis chapter 4. I'm not going to keep you too long, but we're just going to lay some, some, uh, some, some, some groundwork. I, I got a call. Before we read, I got a call. I think it was Tuesday morning. I was in my office and I was at the computer. And Mark, my cousin Mark called, who was Sherman's. And most of you know my cousin Sherman. He's Sherman's younger brother. Uh, uh, Sherman has uh, two brothers. One is Mose, and, and then there's Mark, the one that called me, and there's Sherman. Sherman's the oldest brother. They have an older sister named Jackie. She has a PhD, all kind of PhD. She's a college professor in Maryland. And then the shield of this school that's in the Bronx. And so when I'm studying at my computer, I don't answer the uh, the phone because I can lose you know, my place. I get distracted. If the Lord's talking to me, I want to just keep typing. And Mark's number, his name didn't come on the screen. So I thought it was spam. And so I know it was the Holy Spirit to pick up. And I, I, I picked up the phone, and, and, and he's a jokester, so he started praying because he sounded like my brother Joe. And I said, hey, Joe, what's going on? He said, hey, Butchie. I said, what's going on? He said, not much. He said, Butchie, this is not Joe. I said, because he sounds just like me. He said, no, this is your, this your cousin Mark. Since Patsy passed away, Mark called me about once or twice a month just to check. Yeah. 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 You know, just to check up on me. And so, uh, Mark is, he, he's, he's straight up from the street, <laughs> you know, he's from the street, so we joked around for a little while, and uh, he told me, he said, but you, you know I'm from the street, and this is what he said, out of nowhere, uh, the conversation wasn't going in that direction, he just said, but you, you know I'm from the street, I, he said, I'm the street man, I'm from the street, I, that's the way he talked, I'm from the street. He said, he said, but I found something out, he said, I used to always think I was always in trouble, because I was always in the wrong place at the wrong time. He said, but I now know that I, I, if I was there, I was supposed to be there. Because there's something God wanted me to see. And he said, I just didn't respond right then. 
He said, but if I was there, God wanted me to be, be there but uh, because it was something I was supposed to learn, something I was supposed to see. But I, but back then, I didn't understand. But now I got revelation. This is a brother, you know, and he's talking. And while he's talking, I don't want to let him know. And I'm typing down what he's telling me. You know, I'm on the computer because he, he just began to minister. And I'm listening to him. And I said, Mark, you, God has given you such wisdom because his, his, his brother Sherman and his brother Moses, they both have that wisdom. Their father Moses was a seer. He was a he, he, he had wisdom. And my father, my my father John, and and Sherman's dad Moses. We were kids in the fifties. Uh, the African man, I think I told you about him. We used to call him Mr. Taylor. We call him that because we didn't know how to pronounce his last name. And and he never corrected us. And they would be up all night. And as kids, you know, the, the TV's in the front room. So if they're, if they're doing this in the, in the living room, you, you're you not watching TV. So as, as kids, we're sitting down on the couch. And my dad and, and Moses and Mr. Taylor on their knees. And they're talking about of a tree, so a moon, but they're talking about the Gold Coast, they're talking about the Chad and the different parts of Africa. And as kids, you know, we're just sitting down bored, halfway knocked out. But we began to understand that, that there was a spirit of wisdom that they would meet, they would bring wisdom into our house. And even though, uh, you know, we weren't serving the Lord, not, you know, like we are now, there was a spirit of wisdom. My dad used to say that his parents, uh, his, his grandmother, Grandma Lizzie, she told him that he was born with a veil over his eyes. And, you know, back down south, that meant that you could see into the spiritual realm. And so my father told my sister Pat that she was born with a veil over her eyes because Pat had that gift as well. I would see Pat looking at me sometimes, and I, you know, I'm a kid brother, so I said, what you looking at? You know, and, and she would just shake her head and, and, and turn. But I used to see my father uh, you know, look at me the same way. And so as I'm talking to Mark on Tuesday morning, the Holy Spirit took me back to my father. How he would just kind of look at me and I say, yeah, daddy. And and, he, and, I, and I'd see my sister Pat sometimes. She'd just be standing and, and just looking at me. And I, I said, you, you, you know, you ain't got been nothing better to do. With, you know, what you're looking at me for? Like that. She would just shake her head and turn away. There's a, there's a gift that God will give. And I don't know, I know, was it 1 Corinthians 14 says, desire the best gift. Pray that you prophesy. Um, mm. Ask God for a gift. John had to tell me in California, I guess he saw, he said, pray for the gift of the servant. He said, pray for the gift of wisdom. So I do, I was praying for it, not knowing the spiritual definition. of it. I didn't know the spiritual definition of hope. And Paul said in first. Uh, uh, Ephesians the first chapter I pray that that you be enlightened that, that you know the hope of God's calling that you be enlightened and, and that's what we have to pray for now especially now you have to be enlightened and, and, and that word hope in the Greek is not the hope that we use when we say well, I hope I pass the test or I hope I get the job No, it is the definite article it means that what you're hoping for is already taking place in the realm of the spirit it means that what you're hoping for, in other words, I hope I see what has already taken place. I'm not hoping that it occur. And so when God, when Paul said I, uh, that you would know the hope of his calling, remember, we come into this world uh, with gifts that no one comes into the earth without permission of God. Good, bad, indifferent. Every child that is born, God knows. Their heads and their heads, remember, they are uh, numbered. I don't understand that fingerprint DNA. How we can find lineages of thousands of years? I, even today, I, I think I mentioned before the Jewish people, Cohen. It means priest, the Kohathites. It's a short uh, a, a Cohen. They can trace their bloodline back to Aaron. Powerful. And so we operate. We operate most of the time in such finite knowledge. You know, you know what we see and smell and touch and hear. But there's a realm that we have to actually operate in, even though I've never seen an angel, I've never seen the Lord with my physical eye, I have evidence that he is in my life. You have evidence that he's in your life. Everyone in here, I'm looking at you, there's evidence that you're born again. And whatever your struggles are, I, they all just send them to me. 
And I say, yeah, they're born again. Not only did they receive the Lord, I've seen the Lord that they've received in them. Hallelujah. And so this is what uh, God uh, uh, is speaking of when he said that we are to be enlightened with the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge of him. See, not just knowledge, knowledge of him. Right, knowledge puffs up and knowledge of him. It, it, it allows us to grow in our boldness and our confidence on, and who he is. Because this is when he speaks in, in Luke chapter 10, when you know when Jesus is speaking to them, and he said it in verse 19 that you're to tread on serpents and scorpions. You know, and he's speaking about, about the demonic realm. He, he's not talking about asking Satan to please move over or please move out the way. He said, you are to tread on serpents and scorpions. And that's a powerful statement because serpents, they attack at the head and, and, and scorpions attack at the tail. So he's saying that, that when you're treading upon them, you could kill, you could kill less whether their head is raised or their tail. Then you're stepping right on them. This is the, the, the heel, remember the heel of the seed of the woman. Bruce, they, uh, the head of the seed, the head of the seed of the serpent. So Satan is walking around in the earth with an incurable wound. And you and I are the only ones that know why. You and I are the only ones that know he has a wound that will never heal. Now you and I, we can be wounded in our spirit, wounded in our emotion, and we serve uh, Jehovah Rapha. He, he can touch us he, and he can hear, but you have to speak that word. The angels are waiting for marching orders. You have to give them instruction. You, you, you listen, the things that, what did Jesus, when, when the disciples came up to the disciples prayer, we call it the Lord's prayer, but it's the disciples prayer. They said, teach us how to pray. But he said, thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth. On earth, as it is in heaven. And we know that Christ will literally have his kingdom here after the millennium reign. He reigns, and they said, we don't even need a son, because he likes the whole world. <laughs> but <clears throat> that can be a passing passage if your boldness in the word of God is not growing. If your boldness in the things of God is not going, you have to begin to tread. Listen, I, I'm, I'm telling you, if you don't put Satan under your feet, if you allow his lies to penetrate your mind and take control over your tongue. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You, to, you know, stop telling wrong things in your life. Stop allowing wrong things in your life to, uh, to, to, to choose. Yeah. If it's in your life, don't, don't allow it to chew. Don't give it an option whether it stays or goes. Hallelujah. Right. Amen. If the yeah, you know, the Holy Spirit, as we were preparing for this, the Holy Spirit, some of you remember a couple, of, uh, a little while now ago, I had a really bad case of acid reflux. I mean, and it only bothered me on Sundays on Wednesday night when I was going to teach. I, I could, I'd be all, I wouldn't be coughing all week. And at the same time, Sister Linda had it as well, Sister Lester. And she was telling me, now you got to stop eating broccoli, you got to stop eating peppermint. It, it, everything that has acid, you, you just put it, you stop, stop eating. The doctor didn't tell me that. He told me the broccoli, but I was always, you know, sucking on peppermint. She said, Pastor, you're not supposed to be sucking on peppermint. And so I'm sitting up in my bed at home. And I'm, uh, I'm not coughing, I'm sitting up, and the Holy Spirit said to me so clearly, how long are you going to put up with this mess? And I said, well, he said, this is not sickness, this is an attack from the devil. That very, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, that very moment I said, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over this thing, and that acid reflux in a matter of hours was gone. Hallelujah. I was not coughing, occasionally I get a cough and I put the word on it quick. As soon as I cough, I said, no, 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 it's gone. Amen. The Holy Spirit said to me, how long are you going to, don't give wrong things in your life a choice. Amen. Don't give wrong things in your life an option. Amen. You have to speak as though, the, you understand that heaven's power is behind you when you're speaking the word of God. Right. You know, I'm not asking you to say what I think. Remember, hope, according to the Greek, means that it's already taken place. It is the definite. Right? It's the perfect, it's the perfect article. I said definitely the perfect. That means it's already taking place. What you're doing is hoping that you see it. Amen. 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 Okay. 
Uh, Second Timothy uh, 3, starting at verse 1. Listen to what it said. Now, this, I, let me just say this once more. There's certain people you have to get out of your life. You have to run from. I believed that in California in 1980, when I went to California, that I was slow in making that decision. I believe that the Lord made it so that I had to go to California. I mean, I could have, you know, disobeyed God. didn't see God's plan at the time. But as soon as I got there, the same year, I received the Lord at, at Crenshaw, what did you say? Not again. It was still 1980. When I, I've been saved for 40. I was thinking about this 43 years. I've been walking with the Lord. Amen. And sometimes I say, Lord, I, sometimes I feel as dumb as I was. <laughs> so I say, how come? It, it, you can never be as dumb as you started with God. Amen. Because there are Amen. things that you may think that, that you would like to see more maturity and a more advancing. But, but God says, you're taking the wrong inventory. You need to look at the things that what I've done in your life. Don't, uh, don't allow the devil to give you an inventory of who you are. Remember, if he, can, if he can penetrate your thoughts and penetrate your mind, you're in trouble. Yeah. You need to call for Pastor Dave. You need to call for the deacons. You need to call for somebody and get hands laid on you right away. Yeah. Because if you are, if your thoughts are, I, I read an article this morning that, uh, about a, a, a psychological disease called ruminating. And ruminating is when you constantly are uh, going back in your life and, and looking at uh, circumstances and situations and, and saying, I wish I would have handled that differently. I wish I, and, and some part of that is normal, but if you're constantly doing that, it, it's called ruminating. That means, now you and I, it's called demonic. It's when the devil keeps taking you back to try and change something you can't change. Yeah, yeah. If you place the blood under it, Hallelujah. over it, if you place the blood over you, you're not supposed to look back unless there's something that you did back then that you're still doing now. Remember I said, if you finished and you turn your back on that thing, any voice that come to you is not of God. But if you have not stopped doing it, then that's the Holy Spirit convincing you that you need a course correction. See, that's all Cain needed. Cain needed a course correction. But he chose, rather than making a simple course correction, to murder his competition. You see, some people are evil. And Christians don't want to use that word. We want to use the word, well, you know, they, they have a diff time. No, some people are straight up evil. <laughs> and you need to pray and ask God who they are. Not so you can hate them. Remember, we entertain angels on the web. So we're supposed to treat everyone with a sense of decorum, with a sense of respect. But understand this, that some people are evil and they come to spy out your liberty. They come to put you in shackles, penetrate your mind, learn information about you so they can take it to other people that don't like you. I had a young man come up to me one time and ask me some really personal questions. I just looked at him and I said, man, what you going to do with that information? I don't you know, I knew him well, but said, so, so why would you ask something like that? What 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 are you and they said, I just want to know. And the Holy Spirit showed me at the moment that they were asking who sent them to ask. I found out a little later that the two of them were hooking up. <laughs> Holy Spirit gave me revelation right then. Who sent them to ask? Because because the young man was, I, I love him to this day, just precious heart. It, it wasn't like him, but it was like us. Thank you. <laughs> huh? No, I'm not a misogynist. No, I'm not a, well, I am a chauvinist, but I, but I'm a chauvinist in a good way. I'll open the door for you. I'll pull the seat out for you all the way out. <laughs> oh, Lord, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, Lord, I Second Timothy uh, 3, verse 1. That's what he said. Second Timothy 3, verse 1. But know this. What is he saying? He's speaking to young Timothy. It's Paul writing to young Timothy. But know this. And that in the last days, so times of stress or perilous times will come, times of stress. Perilous times will come. You know that's where we are. And I'm not. I'm not one of those ones that say God told me these last days. But but, I, but all the pastors that I know, 
that are, that are praying men of God, that are praying women of God, they've said it, and I believe that what God has told them. Amen. Amen. Now, too, says, for men will be lovers of themselves. Now, listen to this. Lovers of themselves. Ain't that what's happening right now? Lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. What? Boasters? Of proud? Blasphemers? Disobedient to parents? Unthankful? Listen to this. Unholy? Unloving? That means irreconcilable? When it says unloving, irreconcilable, that means that you're wasting your time if you have not con consulted the Lord and whether or not, firstly, uh, are you to stop approaching this person and just turn them over to the Lord and move on? Well, see, God got more than one a, a person, a laborer, that he can send into a person's life. Remember, Elijah said that I'm the only one that's left. But in God's, I got 6,000 that haven't bowed their need to bear. But he felt with all the pressure that was coming against him, uh, with Ahab and his wife Jezebel and, and uh, you know the priests of Jezebel, the priests of Baal everybody was coming against him he felt overwhelmed, he said I'm the only one that's speaking righteous, God said no I got 6,000 that haven't bowed their knee you just don't know them but I have six, I have others and there's sometimes there are people that you just gotta put on the altar beloved and it's not because you don't love them it's not because you don't care about them you are still asking God to send laborers into their life to, 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 to win them to the kingdom into the kingdom of God but they cannot they're, they're wasting your time and I'm not talking about prayer I'm not talking about prayer because prayer is never a waste of time I'm talking about you have to turn them over to God because they're irreconcilable. That means the damage that has been done, only God can restore. You have planted the seed, someone else will come and water, but it's all the harvest. Jesus will bring the increase if they are part of the elect. And if they're not part of the elect, you treat them like they're part of the elect. Because only God makes that distinction of goats and sheep. A brother of it said one time, he, he, he was an attorney, he said, I, uh, and I know he was, you know, here I'm a pastor, I was driving that old uh, uh, Volvo, some of you remember, I had just come from a conference in Ohio where I, I hit a deer on the, it was an old 240D standard, some of y'all remember that old blue car, it had gray primer on the side, and, and I hit a deer coming back from uh, uh, Apostle Richard's uh, conference, a, a three-day conference, it was wonderful. And I'm driving, I'm praying in the spirit, having a wonderful time with the Lord. And I'm coming, I hit a deer. And man, it just, man, I didn't realize, because the deer was in the middle of the road. It was big. But it, it was pointing this way. And those things are quick, man. Because I'm, I'm driving, it looked like it was going to go this way. And in a moment, it turned and ran back. And I didn't have enough time to do anything. And the yeah, was moving a little fast. And, and it hit the deer, crushed up the front of my car. And I, I would tell you how I was treated by some of the people in that county. It, it was it was disgraceful because they saw that I was a black man in a white county, hit one of their dead. They were more concerned about the dead than they were about me. And I'm on the side, and I'm and you know yeah, I'm, I'm I'm praising God because I was I was uh, spared, and I'm, I'm pulling on the side. These people pulling up on their cars on their motorcycles, and they go and. They, Pull the deer, they pull the deer to the side. One guy takes a stick and kills the deer to put him out of his ministry. And they looked at me and just turned their head and walked back to their car, getting in their car. And so I'm standing there, I'm saying to myself, hey, is there no love for the brother? <laughs> this young white state trooper pulls up with the eyes of an angel. He pulls up in his car. He said, Mr. Are you okay? Do you need me to call anybody? You know, this is an early uh, 90s. I, I may have had a cell phone. I, you know, I probably did have a cell phone. He said, you need me to call anybody? Need me to help you with anything? So the car was still operational. So I drove into New York with a banged up front of the car. But just as I saw evil, God renewed my confidence in his protection. Because this young man, I mean, he just looked like an angel. He just looked, he just looked. And I don't know if he's born again, but he looked like he came straight from church service. The tenderness in his countenance. Verse 4 
uh, verse 3, unloving, irreconcilable, unforgiving, see, uh, unforgiving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, listen, brutal, despisers of good. Verse 4, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form, say form, form, of godliness, but denying his power. And from such, what did it say? Turn away. Now, what, that's a powerful statement. Having a form of godliness, uh, they, 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 um, having a form of godliness, but denying his power. In other words, if, if I'm in church and I'm sitting under the word of God, at some point, it has to have some uh, it has to profit. Amen. If I'm sitting under the pure word of God, like you are, amen, it has to profit. There has to be a change in my life. There has to be something. Now listen, that does not mean that, that you're not going to be the target of sin that's at the door. Remember God told uh, a, a king, he said, if you do the right thing, it, it'll be accepted on you. But if you don't, what did he say? Sin is at the door and its desire is for you. Now, sin just wasn't that game's door, it was that evil's door too. Sin's at your door. Sin's at my door. And its desire is for us. That's how the enemy gets us to, to try and follow his breadcrumbs away from God. To follow his, his tracks. Or his, you know, he lives in little goodies, right? To abandon. Oh, Lord, Did you hear me? Yes. Yes. To abandon the course that we want for God. And they, they, these little guys, and, 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 you know, I was listening to Dick last Sunday. Dick said, I don't listen to all these programs. I listen to sports. I listen to sports. Hey, you know, I, I, I listen to maybe a program or two I'm not supposed to. But when that program or two begins to show me that I'm not supposed to, I'm going. Some programs I want to give the benefit of the doubt. I like, you know, some old comedy. I look at old comedies. I love the three stupid. I don't love them, but, uh, you know, three stupid, you know. I love the Marx Brothers, you know, Groucho, Harpo, Lupo, and uh, <laughs> A Day in the Races is one of the greatest comedies to me. You have to see that it is bananas. But if, if the enemy, and we know his strategy, we know his tactics, we're not unaware of his devices. And, and so when Paul speaks in Galatians, who has bewitched you? Have you begun in the spirit? And not, you know, who has the Because if you don't guard these gates, yeah. if it, and, and some Christians they don't they don't take that serious. And we're in such an age of wickedness. Yeah. We're in su listen. I was listening to TV the other day. Now you can order weed delivery. Yeah. Just like Grubhub, you can go online. Yeah. <laughs> And choose Alcapulco Gold, Panamanian, Panamanian Red. And if you don't want your neighbors to know you're smoking, now you can order gummies. And don't act like y'all. <laughs> now you can order gummies. In other words, now you don't have to light up. Remember back in the in the seventies when y'all did that. <laughs>
It's not, and I'm not saying that you, you, you know, this is not condemnation, it's not pressure, but, but you don't want to have a form of godliness, but deny the power. Because when, it, it, when you have godliness, the power of it transforms. That's yeah. what the Bible says in the New Testament. It transforms yeah. from darkness to light. So if you, and again, if you're struggling with areas, this is for you, like it's for me. You know, I'm not, I have to teach these things, so I try the best uh, before I come to you on Sunday to repent of anything I have to teach that I'm not mature in or that I'm still dealing with. But like you, the areas of my life, they're not the major areas of my life that I used to deal with anymore. I'm a mature Christian. Many of you are as well. But you don't want to live in a form of godliness. There is a responsibility for revelation. If, if God reveals something to you, then it, that's, that's mean that you are now ignoring the express word of God, the understood word of God. That's a dangerous place to be. In Genesis uh, 4, verse 1, listen to what he said. I'm not going to be before you very long. I just want to plant this with Adam and, and Abel. We're going to get to the part where, uh, where Paul writes in uh, there's two powerful prayers in the book of Ephesians. One is in Ephesians 1 and the other is in Ephesians chapter 3. But he tells us that the eyes of your understanding, listen to me, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you know what the hope of his calling is. Yeah. And, and, so, and each and every one of us have the eyes of our understanding enlightened to a, a degree. You and I could walk into a place and something just happened. Just when I walked in here this morning, I could feel the presence of God. I knew you guys had a wonderful uh, 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 a Sunday school. You could feel the, the presence of fellowship. You can feel the, everything that was taking place in here. That's the spirit of enlightenment. You have that spirit of enlightenment. But just like you can tell when the Holy Spirit is moving, you can tell when the enemy is moving. You could walk into a place. And sometimes I said, well, you know, nobody wants to embarrass people. We're not here to, you know, humiliate people. But you can walk into a place and you clearly can hear the Holy Spirit say, you know, you, you don't belong here. Yeah. And it's not because you want to sin. It's a, you just don't belong to You don't want your good to be evil spoken of. You know, you know you, some places you're just not supposed to be seen anymore. And it's not because you're doing certain things now. You, I, listen, you could see me talk to a prostitute in the street and you could say, Pastor, what? I don't care. I'm a pastor. She needs prayer. I'm going to pray for her. I, I was walking to the bank one day. This young lady sitting on the side not too long ago. She's sitting on the side of the street and she's crying. So I, I parked my car. I'm going into the bank and I look and she's crying. I come back. Holy Spirit said, well, like I said, I said, are you okay? And she just looked up and put her head down and started crying. I said, can I pray for you? She said, yeah. Seldom will people say no. In their worst state, they know the power of prayer. And, and you are there, like you know, my cousin Mark told me, no, I, I may have been, I used to say I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. No, if I was there, something God wanted me to see. So if, if you're there, sometimes if, if, I, 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 I told you one time I was walking from my house to from 117th Street, Morningside, to the church, 145th Street. I said, I'm just going to walk. I think I was meeting somebody over there. And I'm walking, and there was a lady on the park. You know how you get to about 127th Street, Morningside Park has the benches. And there was a lady on the phone. She was cursing. She was screaming. She, whoever she was talking to, she was letting them know that she was not pleased with them. And so as I'm walking by, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just not mind your business. You know, you're still in love. You know? So I walk up and the Holy Spirit said, go back. I went back. I said, how you doing? I approached like this. How you doing? I'm not trying to get into your business. I said, I'm a pastor. And I said, I, I, I just heard you talking. I said, can I pray for you? She looked at me like that, took her phone and put it aside and said, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? How people in the throes yes. of a meltdown. Yes. You, if you offer them prayer, you don't have to pray like, Father in, in heaven, just say, Lord, and I, my sister here, having a tough day. I'm just asking you to make the rest of her day the best day she's ever had. Yes. 
I'm asking that you go with her today. Let her know that your eyes are upon her. That's why you told me to stop. And you told me to come back for her. I said, what's your name? She told me her name. And you told me to come back for souls. Hallelujah. 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 Okay, Genesis 4, verse 1. Hallelujah. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Say, she conceived. She conceived. And she can bore who? I mean, she bore who? Cain. And said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Hold Genesis 4. Hold it, because you're going to flip right back. Go to 1 John chapter 3. Hold Genesis 4. Because you're going to flip right back to it. Mothers always think that their child is the cat's meow. Right? That's why that's a mother. That's a mother's heart, isn't it? You, you can, uh, my mother would get so upset with me sometimes, but, but I knew that when I would call in, in California and I couldn't find work in 1980, and I knew my mom didn't have much money, and, 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 I, and I told her, I, I didn't call to ask for money. She said, are you, are you okay? I couldn't find, I couldn't even get a temporary job. In California, you gotta have a car. And I'm in Pasadena, I had to, if I got a temp job in LA, I had to take two, three buses just so, they didn't have the, uh, the, the transit line then, there's all buses, so you had to connect. And, and I'm getting home from a, a, a minimum wage job at, at, at nine and 10 at night. And, and if you miss that bus coming from Los Angeles, that means you're gonna spend the night on a park bench because the service cut down at a certain time back in the 80s. And, and, and it didn't pick up until about next bus, six in the morning. And so um, my mom sent me some, some money, wasn't much. And I, and I, took, I sent it right back. And she said, boy, you must have changed. I, you, I love money. She said, you never sent it back. I sent it right back. I said, mom, time for me to grow up. I said, it's it just time for me to grow up. I said, I'm sitting under the principles of God. I, I'm just, I just got born again. And I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening to Dr. Johnson and John. I'm sitting under the principle of God. I'm beginning to grow. And so I'm not, uh, I didn't pray, you know, whether I should send it back. I read the letter. I saw the money. I put it in the letter. I said, Ma, I'll send it right back. Hallelujah. And unbeknownst to me, that's a step of faith. I'm, I'm stepping out on what little I, I had. I couldn't ask a mountain to move yet. I didn't get that sermon yet. But the, the little that I had that I could I could step into. Now listen. Eve said she had received a man child from the Lord. First John uh, three, verse twelve. Listen what it says, New King James. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. Not as Cain, who was of the who? Wicked, wicked one and murdered his brother. brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous so what did i tell you it tells you that even if Cain would have offered god the same blood sacrifice offering that abel offered him that god accepted god would have rejected a Cain's blood sacrifice because Cain's heart was evil see god places a premium on our intent and Cain would have come to god simply because he wanted to uh, be accepted of god but he didn't want to accept god how do you get to a place in the age of, you're just stepping out of the age of innocence because sin had just uh, uh, cast the parents out of the garden and you get to a place simply because your brother's offering was received and yours were not that you killed your brother. What's in your heart already? And see, this is what God knows. This is why you and I as Christians, the eyes of our understanding have to be open because there's a lot of people who love the Lord that are going to be much more mature later than they are right now. But if you hook up with them right now, remember I did a teaching years ago, throw, throw Jonah from the boat. And the whole thing was about Jonah was a prophet, but he was going in the wrong direction. God told him to go one place and he was in a, he was in a hurry to go in another place. And so when the waves started, stirred up, they, the people on the boat were asking, why is this happening? What did Jonah say? <laughs> Just throw me overboard. And the storm will stop. And I said that if you hooked up with this prophet, because he was a prophet, God didn't rescind the call. God didn't rescind the charge on his life. He said, 
He said, if you throw me overboard, the storm will stop. And so they, they chose lots for who, who, who's there. And they, they wind up throwing Jonah overboard. But God had already prepared a fish for him to spit him up in a place of obedience. Because the charge was still on his life. The anointing was still on his life. He had some struggles obeying God because he hated the Ninevites. He hated the Assyrians because they were racist. And he was a racist. He knew God was a merciful God. And he knew that if he had gone to Nineveh and preached the word, it's the shortest sermon in all the Bible. If he had gone to Nineveh and preached the word, that the, that the Assyrians would repent and God would show mercy on them. And he didn't want God to show mercy upon them because they were wicked. And they did repent, and their repentance lasts for 100 years. Because of the smallest sermon in the Bible, and he, God didn't give up on them, but had, God knew where he was going. You, you don't fool God by saying that God told me to go to Jezreel, but I'm going to make it over here to Tarsha. He's going in another direction. He asked the God that, that knows exactly where we are. Yeah, that's right, that's right. What we're struggling with. Yeah, right. And made provision that even when we take a wrong turn and we follow the rabbit trail or we get caught up in something, he's right there. That's why you hear him say, when are you going to repent? I'm here. The prodigal son said, he, said, he came to himself. As I was better in my father's house. He's eating the shucks than he's feeding the pigs. A Jew feeding pigs. And what did he do? He, he, when he came to himself, he said, oh, all I got to do is go home. I don't have to keep running. God, God, is a, God stands like this. Not like this. All I got to do is go home. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why you should always go to Pennsylvania to my grandmother's house. I just called and said, Grandma, I'm going to get a, 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 a bus ticket or a Greyhound. I, can I come spend a couple of days with you? She said, oh, my grandson is coming to see me. She said, come on. Now, now, my mother already got on the phone and told her, guess what he did? He got another. <laughs> and every time I arrived in Uniontown off the Greyhound bus, Grandma's standing there smiling. And she said, come on, with you. She said, you, me, you and Grandma, we're going to have a good time. Yes. She never asked me once. I'm gonna, I know now because you already knew. But, <laughs> but she never asked me once, why? What did I do this time? Never. Never, never brought it up. We just sat there and talked. I had a big upright piano, old piano, in the parlor. She'd sit there in the morning, every morning, playing, singing. Got a heathen upstairs being transformed <laughs> by the atmospheric change. And a little rickety house on 72nd Cool Spring Street in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. See, God has hiding places for us. He has shelters that, that we may not see it at the time when we're, that we're you know, running from him, running from trouble, running from our parents, running, but he has places of refuge. You, you know the Bible, they have cities of refuge for the, for the Levites in case you kill somebody and there was a blood oath against you and the, and the brother or the, the family member, they, they could kill you and, and, and get retribution unless you made it to a city of refuge first. But if you got into a city of refuge, they couldn't kill you. Now the stipulation was that you could not leave the city of refuge. You had to stay there until the priest died. When the high priest died, then you could go back to your people and the person couldn't kill you. But if you left before the priest died, it, it was open territory. You see people in another family locking and loading. I saw them on 16th. They could take you out. But God, he, he prepared all of these cities of refuge in the Old Testament. He prepared all these things. And now Jesus has become our in place. All these things and all these ceremonies and all these things that were temple in the Old Testament pointed us to God. Hallelujah. And so that means that there's nothing you can do that you cannot bring to Christ. If they killed in the Old Testament, they were adulterers in the Old Testament. They were so bad in Leviticus. God said, 
Man, not just supposed to sleep with a dog. Not supposed to sleep with an animal. They were just as bad as today. How in the world does a holy God conceive something that a man would ever sleep with a poodle? The heart is above all things deceitfully wicked. He said, who can know it, Jeremiah? said, who can know it? But I, the Lord, judge the heart and give each person according to their and the ways is not according to how we behave, well, you know, in our struggle. The way is that we've come into the way. Remember, Christ was called the way. And so when we can, when you and I receive Jesus Christ, and all of your sins have been wiped away. His righteousness, the righteousness of a holy God has been imputed to us through our faith in the Son. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Oh, hallelujah. The righteousness of God in him. Not the righteousness of Peter and David and Moses. The holy righteousness of God. Without stain or tint. Removed and across the east and from the west. The righteousness of God. But we don't know how to handle that. Because our finite minds can't even comprehend it. We can say the scripture. Yeah, I'm the righteousness of God. Yeah, sometimes we have no idea what that means. But the devil knows. And that's why you're not supposed to tell them, please move over. You're supposed to tread on them. If you don't step on them, if you don't tread on them, that means you don't know. You may know the scripture. It may be a form of godliness. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. You know, we may know the verse. But you're supposed to tread on them and notice that he's already wounded. And it hasn't even taken place yet. In the, it, it takes place in the realm of the spirit. Revelation 13, 8 said the lamb was slain. Before the foundation of Hallelujah. So nothing surprises God. Hallelujah. 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 Nothing surprises God. Yes. I said, God, I'll never do it. I swear in the stack of Bible, you will hear next Friday, two o'clock, and she don't call. Yes. <laughs> and you know you're weak for her. You're weak for him. Now you better get a little quiet. Uh, get on pious right now. <laughs> God knows what we are. He knows who we are. When she said, I got a man child with the Lord, I said, No, no, he's other wicked. But as a mother, I know you see that. Now, what is the difference between Cain and you and I when we did wickedness? We were not of the wicked one. We were divinely elected, but simply hadn't made our election sure yet. We were being wooed by wherever you are right now, whatever your struggles are, you are here because God told you to come in. And you, that means that God is still talking to you, that God is still wooing you, he's calling you. And the fact that you're here means that you're hearing and you're still surrendering, regardless of what you're struggling with. There's nothing the blood cannot cleanse. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And God puts it all in one category, unrighteousness. That's why he said Cain's deeds were unrighteous. Back to Genesis 4. Oh, 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 hold on. Let me just finish reading uh, 1 John 3, uh, 12. Not as Cain, for he was of the wicked one and murdered his brother and... And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers, uh, Abel's, were righteous. Okay. Uh, Genesis 4. Amen? Amen. Give it a couple of minutes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God knew there was something wrong with that boy. Didn't he? Yes. God knew. God knows. God knows. Right? Right? Now, the, the wonderful thing about it, God knows, but God is not... You know, he doesn't, no one is by predetermination except from God's grace. God gives Cain an opportunity to get it right. Even though he said he was on the wicked one. God, God comes to him doing sacred parenting. Sacred parenting is when, you know, you have a child and there's a bully. And the bully's coming up and, and you know your child's having a problem with him. And, and, and you, you keep telling your child, son. Oh, daughter, you gotta fight them. You, you gotta fight them. Kid, you, you gotta fight them. Because they're gonna keep coming until you, you, you gotta fight them. 
What is sacred parenting? The parent goes in the house because the parent doesn't want the son to have a lasting memory in their mind or the daughter to have a lasting memory in their mind that their father saw them get their butt whipped. Yeah. So the father goes in the house. But what does the father do? He pulls the blinds. <laughs> he gonna let the bully kill his kid. That's right. That's right. And even if you get one lick in when you come in, I'm so proud of you. I saw that left. Ali had a left like that. I saw that left. It, yeah, yeah, you you know, you saw his left, but now it's I saw I can have you left. Like but you're talking about you you, you say, I saw the left. I, I saw what you did. And the bully would rather take from somebody who's not gonna fight him than rather than have to fight a person every day. Yeah. And so after a while you'll find that the bully will say, like, no, he's cool, he got hard. <laughs> Thank God for that, right? Because yes. the butt whoopers hurt. Yeah. And the bully will keep coming. Yeah. And Satan will keep coming. Yeah. Because sin is at the door. Yeah. And it's not at the door because you've done something wrong inside the house. That's what the devil does. Sin is at the door. You have to open the door to let a man. And that's what Cain did. And so was at Abel's door just as much he was at Cain. As a matter of fact, he probably was more at Abel's door than he was at Cain's. Because Cain was resisting him. He was resisting him. Amen. 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 In Genesis 4 2. And she bore again. And this time, uh, at this time, his son Abel. And now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground unto the Lord. And Abel also brought the first born of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. And the Lord did what? Respected Abel and his offering. Verse 5. But he did not respect Cain and his offering and Cain was angry and his countenance fell. And verse 6 said, so the Lord said to Cain, listen to our Lord. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? Listen to what God says now, verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Huh? He's, he's telling them all you need is a course correction. He knew he wasn't going to do it, just like he knew that Judas wasn't going to repent. He didn't make Judas in, uh, uh, irrepentant. I don't know if that's a word. Uh, unrepentant. And he didn't make Cain to kill his brother, but he knows the hearts of man. Yes, yes, yes. Verse 7. If you do well, will it not be accepted? God was telling him about a course correction. And if you do not well, then sin, listen to this. Listen carefully, beloved. Sin lies at the door. And its desire is towards you. But here's the part I love. But you should rule over it. See, everybody that wants you, you don't have to want them. That's the desperation we find nowadays. We find young ladies and young men so desperate for, for affirmation, so, so desperate for comfort, so desperate for company, so desperate that they're, they're making bad choices. And in the midst of their bad choices, regardless of how bad it's God, God comes and says, okay, let's make a course correction. If you simply do this, but now Cain, instead of making a course correction, he decided to murder the competition. It's coming right out of the age of innocence. What in the world would make uh, uh, the, the second and third people created on earth to have a heart full of such wickedness that he'd kill his brother? Sin. Even at his infancy, it brought death. That's right. Jesus. See, this is why, you know, the church has backed away from teaching on sin. And so now you got everything in the church. Now you go to a, now you go to a, um, a concert. And when you get there, you don't know if a Christian artist is coming out or Beyonce. Right? You see, you you can't you can't allow a 
mixture. And as much as we try, all of us got it in some area of our life. But when you identify it and you ask God for revelation and how to rule over it, and God shows you, and you ignore, that's what Cain did. And, and we, we somehow forget that the heart can be desperately wicked. My heart, your heart, in a New York minute. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 5. But he said, but he did not have respect to Cain's offering, and Cain was very ang uh, uh, um, angry, and his countenance fell. Uh, verse 6. Uh, okay, I read that. Okay, turn to Hebrews 11. Okay. Hebrews 11. We're going to read and we're going to close. Amen. Hebrews 11. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You getting anything out of this book? Yes. Amen. 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 See, but Paul prayed that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. And especially now, because the, the, the enemy uh, the enemy has taken uh, his warfare, right? And warfare is every day. He's taken his warfare to such a sinister level that that, that you know, you really have to be discerning, man. You know, John said, try the spirit to see if God, that's not being, uh, a con you know, condemning. It's not being critical or, or judging, although Christians are supposed to judge. God said, don't throw your pearls before it's fine. You got to know what's unclean to keep your pearls in your pocket. Right? You know, so God gives us, a, that's not judging, that's discerning. It's, it's not judgment in the way the world looks at it, but it's making a judgment. That, that I have to I have to have eyes of my understanding and light. I need to see what's going on here. I can't just listen to every pastor. I can't just listen to, uh, to, to every preacher. Listen, yes. listen to me. Andy Stanley, man. Andy Stanley is the son of, of Charles Stanley. Yes, right. And now he's become an apostate. I sent the, the clip, the YouTube clip to the board. If you come coming up, you got to see this thing from the pulpit. Yes. You know, people used to tell me things a long time ago, but I wouldn't believe it because I, I would catch them on Sundays and I enjoyed this teaching. I would sit there and people said, no, you got to, you got to, you got to. Got to listen, got to listen. And I didn't want to listen, you know, because I'm catching one Sunday after church and I, I always enjoy it. And then I started, and then they started posting his sermons. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And I said, Lord, oh, this is Charles Stanley's son. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He, he had a church here in the home. Bursting at the seams. Had a clip of the two young men coming into the church together, two young women. I believe everybody's supposed to be in church. Yes. I don't care what your struggle is. I don't care if you're an adulterer, a fornicator, a homosexual, a lesbian. I don't care. Now they got so many things. If you're pansexual, bisexual, <laughs> queer, trans, I, I don't care. I don't care. You're supposed to be in the church. Yes. But if you come to the church, the sermon's not supposed to change. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You and I heard the truth, and the truth made us free. Hallelujah. So you don't choose who hears the truth. You just speak the truth. And, and people are going to be offended, but Jesus told you that. Many offenses are going to come. But you have to speak the truth. Now, the difficulty is if, 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 if all of a sudden your sermon change and you're accommodating the people and now what you're doing, rather than helping them escape the, the enemy who has blinded them, lest the veil should be removed and they will and they be saved. What's that, 2 Corinthians 4? Lest they be saved, the veil be removed and it's only removed in Christ. And so you, you have to teach the word of God. Why? Because I love you too much not to teach the word of God. And I'm too afraid of God. 
to compromise what he said. And, and, and I've been in a church, and some of you remember, we had a young man that came in, and he was in a dress and everything, and, and, and I didn't, uh, he came up for prayer, and I, and I prayed for him, and normally I would uh, I'd lay my head and say, this brother or this one, I didn't want to offend him. The last thing I wanted to do was humiliate this a person who came up. He was a man, yeah. but when I prayed, I said, God, bless them, help them, because I didn't want to offend them. So we're not there to humiliate people and send them home wounded. However, the, work, the, the sword will wound. The sword will wound. But one of the wonderful things is the sword wounds and also the sword binds you. That's what the word does. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you hearing me this morning? Yes. Hallelujah. Okay, Hebrews 11, verse 4. Two more scriptures and we're going to quote. Hebrews 11, verse 4. Are you hearing me this morning? Yes. Are you hearing me this morning? Yes. Are you hearing me this morning? Yes. Say, uh, say, God, God Lord, Lord, open my eyes, open my eyes that, I that I may see. I don't believe everybody said that. I need everybody to say to See, Lord, Lord God, God, open my eyes, open my eyes that, I that I may see. And see, now God's going to open your eyes. And listen to me. Like my cousin Mark said, man, I realized that I wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time. I just realized that I was responding incorrectly to what I saw. But God wanted me to see what I saw. Amen. 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 Hebrews 11 verse 4 it says, uh, uh, it says, by faith, Abel, what did he do? He offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained a witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead still speaks. That's the power of the blood. Remember when he went in the garden and, and Cain had slayed Abel, what did God say? Your brother's blood cries out from the earth because the life of all flesh is where? In the blood. So we plead the blood and it's something that, that was so powerful. I, I, I asked myself how did Abel know what to bring God because nowhere in scripture is Abel told you bring a blood list a blood sacrifice to me because Abel had to have an enlightenment. He was born with a sense of enlightenment because I believe that his parents told him that when they sinned, God took the skins of animals and he covered them both. That's a blood sacrifice because that animal ain't running around with no skin. That animal died. And so the blood was spilled and God covered them. And so I believe Abel in his enlightened state because God says his deeds were righteous. Same thing he said about Job. In his enlightened state, I believe that Abel took, uh, took that hearing uh, the story from mom and dad that he brought God a blood sacrifice. And even though Cain's was rejected, I believe that even if Cain would have brought a blood sacrifice, God would have rejected it because of his heart. Mm -hmm. Because of his heart. So if he would have come with the same sacrifice as, as his brother Abel, I believe God would have said no. You see, there's evil in this world. There's evil. You're not evil. Did, did you hear me? Did you, no, you no, 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 no. Christians need to hear that. You're not evil. All of us made some big mistakes. All of y'all rather made some big mistake, but you're not evil. What we are as human in a fallen earth gave our life to a risen Lord. And by his blood we've been healed. By his blood we've been cleansed. And even though that act took place in 1980 at Crenshaw Christian Center, every day I'm fighting the warfare for a sanctified mind. Because the years, I, years of allowing the devil to penetrate my thoughts and control my tongue. Yes. And though, even though I'm born again on fire for God, I have to fight every day. Yes. A thought will come. It's not like it used to be. A thought will come, and I, that's why I know that scripture. I cast out every imagination. That's an imagination. You're trying to get me to live in an imaginary world. I'm conscious. I live in a conscious place. I will not live in an imaginary world. Yes. 
I cast out every imagination and every high thing that will what? Exalt itself above the what? The knowledge of God. Above the what? Knowledge of God. Not my knowledge, because my knowledge is finite and it's limited. That would exalt itself above the knowledge of God. And God has perfect knowledge. That's why he chose us. Perfect knowledge. And having in a readiness to, and, and take captive every thought. Bring it into the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience and took my obedience. It's fulfilled when I'm in glory and I'm seeing him without a mediator or intercessor and I'm speaking to him face to face. Come on, let's stand. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Hey, Daniel. Daniel. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. The reason the enemy wants you because you're so powerful. So you have to begin to speak that over yourself. 